Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our studies in the Psalms, summer in the Psalms. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Psalms uh, is such a, a wonderful book. Every emotion known to man can be found in the Psalms, and actually how we should respond to those various emotions that, that come our way. Now, we've been looking at uh, Psalm 42 all the way through 49, uh, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 48 and 49 um, this morning, and that actually ends the Sons of Korah Psalms. You'll notice that at the top of these Psalms, beginning in Psalm 42 all the way through 49, you'll see that it is a, a Psalm of the Sons of Korah. Uh, and of course, uh, the sons of Korah were, they were musicians. They were the gatekeepers of the tabernacle and later uh, on, of the temple as well. Um, and, and so these Psalms have some wonderful truth in them. You know, several years ago, uh, I, I can't actually remember how long ago it was, but uh, while I was pastoring, uh, I did a series of messages on the mountains of the Bible. You know, that's a fascinating study to look at all of the mountains that are mentioned in Scripture and uh, for us to learn what took place on those various mountains. Think about it. Um, all the way from Mount Ararat to, to Mount Sinai, you know, to Mount Hermon, uh, to the Mount of Transfiguration, to Mount Calvary, to Mount Zion. I mean, there are all kinds of mountains in Scripture and many wonderful truths for us to gather from what happened on those particular mountains. When we come to Psalm 48, we are introduced to Mount Zion. Mount Zion. Now, what's interesting is that the, the, the mount that is referred to as Mount Zion is really not a very pretty mountain. There are several other mountains that are much prettier by way of landscape than Mount Zion. Nevertheless, the psalmist talks about the beauty of Mount Zion, even though it is not physically beauty. I mean, it doesn't have like the snows on, on Mount Hermon uh, that make that a beautiful mountain, the, the, the green grass on the, the Mount of the Beatitudes. Um, Mount Zion is not all that beautiful in appearance, but what makes it beautiful is that Mount Zion is a term that is actually used uh, for the city of God or the city of Jerusalem. Uh, that's where David came and where the temple uh, was placed. And, and so Mount Zion is beautiful in situation. It's beautiful in elevation, not because of its outward beauty, but because of the fact that the very presence of God was placed there. Now think about this. As you begin your study of the Old Testament, and you start in Genesis, and you start making your way through the Old Testament, one of the things that we discover is the fact that God made a decision to place his presence, his name, in a particular place. And where was that? It was certainly in the city of Jerusalem, but to narrow it down even further, it was on what is referred to as the city of David, the, uh, uh, of Mount Zion, and there is where God placed his presence. Uh, earlier, before the temple was built, of course, um, he placed his name, his presence, uh, in the tabernacle. Uh, but then remember, King David wanted to have a permanent place because um, when the Jews were released from Egypt and they began to travel on their way to Canaan, on their way to Jerusalem, they had a tent of meeting. Uh, that's when the tabernacle was placed and God placed his presence in that tabernacle. And of course, they would move from place to place for really several decades 
um, the tabernacle was placed in a place called uh, Shiloh. Um, and then eventually went from Shiloh and uh, David had it brought uh, to the city of Jerusalem. So whatever you see Mount Zion, it's not so much a focus on the beauty of the landscape, it's the fact that God's presence was there. This is why um, Jewish men um, were required to make a journey to Jerusalem at least three times a year uh, because of the three feasts actually that Pastor Rob mentioned this morning. Uh, but what's interesting about all of this, I, I, I want to read just a, a verse from the book of Exodus. And in uh, Exodus chapter 15, this is, by the way, referred to as the Song of Moses. Um, because in, in Exodus chapter 15, keep in mind now, it was after the Jews had left Egypt. You see, the... The, the leaving of Egypt was accomplished in chapter 12 of Exodus, and now they're, they're moving toward the promised land. And in Exodus chapter 15, um, Moses leads the congregation of the Israelites. He leads them in a glorious song. Um, we don't have time this morning to read that whole song, but one of the things that he says in that song is found in verse 17 of Exodus 15. And it says this, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. What was Moses saying? Moses was telling the Israelites, he was singing songs of praise to God for the fact that he brought them out of Egypt, that he's leading them through the prom uh, toward the promised land. And he says, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. So right there in, um, right there in the book of Exodus, we're reading of the fact that God's presence is going to be on a mountain. Um, over in the New Testament, and I'm going to read a few verses from Hebrews chapter uh, 12 to kind of give us a little bit of background before we tackle Psalm 48. So we know that God was going to place his presence on a mountain. We saw that in Exodus. Now, that was looking forward to what God was going to do when we read it in Exodus. When we read what we're going to read here in Hebrews chapter 12, it's looking back to what God did in having his presence there um, on Mount Zion. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 18, it says, you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words make the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now, of course, we, we read of this in the book of Exodus. Um, he's making reference to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, where God gave the Ten Commandments to, to Moses, God made a, a statement or several statements really to Moses, instructing the people not to come near the mountains. He said, if, if anybody comes up and even touches the mountain, they will be killed. And in fact, we read right here that even if an animal uh, walked up and touched that mountain while God's presence was there, um, they, they would be uh, annihilated. So he says that we haven't come to that kind of mountain. He's now talking in New Testament times. 
right? He's now talking in the days after the Lord Jesus had suffered and died. He had risen from the dead. He has ascended back into, in, into heaven. And now he's saying, we don't come to Mount Sinai. Because when God spoke at Mount Sinai, the people were so frightened. They said, don't let us hear that voice anymore. It scares us. So the writer to the Hebrew says this. Let me reread verse 21. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But then notice verse 22 of Hebrews 12. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. That's Jerusalem. He says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Uh, keep in mind what happened back on Mount Sinai. They didn't want to hear the voice of God. They were so terrified. But here it says now that you've come to Mount Zion. It says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. You see, the difference between these two mountains, Mount Sinai, was a foreboding mountain, one that struck fear. It was the mountain on which God gave us his standards of holiness. He gave his standards of holiness on Mount Sinai. We call them the Ten Commandments. Unfortunately, many people are, people are under the impression that they are the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> and they are not the Ten Suggestions, they are the Ten Commandments. And every one of us in this room, we have violated at least one of them. Many, perhaps, we have all violated. This is why Jesus Christ came into the world. This is why Jesus Christ offered himself as a sacrifice when he was nailed to a cross, he shed his blood, in order that we might be forgiven. But we must come to him in faith. We must come to him trusting in what he did as full payment for our sin. You see, you and I could never, ever pay for our own sin. What would we offer God if we say, well, uh, I will offer him all of my good deeds well, the scripture is very clear. You do not get to heaven on the basis of your good deeds. You get to heaven on, your base, on the basis of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on Calvary's cross. When you recognize that when the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that that includes us, that we're part of of the all when the Bible says all have sinned and therefore we need a savior. This is why we come to church to learn more about this wonderful savior who loved us and gave himself for us. We come to church so we can study his word. <clears throat> Unfortunately today there are a lot of churches that have given up on the Bible. But the Bible is God's word. Jesus Christ told us very clearly that he has given us his word. 
and he has provided the Holy Spirit who helps us to comprehend the scriptures and to apply them to our lives. And so when we think of these two mountains, Mount Sinai is a mount of condemnation, but Mount Zion is a, it is a mountain of acceptance. It's a mountain in, uh, offering us salvation through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So let's go to Psalm 48, because in the 48th Psalm, um, as I've mentioned probably uh, several times, I, I like to put a title uh, on each chapter, and um, I, I've called this one, God's Presence Abides. God's presence abides. Now, of course, the term abide it literally means to remain. It means to stay somewhere. And God chose to place his presence in Mount Zion. He chose to place his presence in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Remember, as the uh, both the tabernacle and the temple, as they were constructed, there, there was a, a, a great outer court where people could meet, um, where the Jews would bring their lamb to offer as a sacrifice. And there were several priests that were there that would help them uh, to take that lamb on the altar and uh, slit its throat and pour out its blood on the altar. Um, and then the um, the, the various priests were able to go into the holy place um, where sacrifices were offered to God, but they could not go into the most holy place, which often we refer to as the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go in once a year on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for the sins of the nation of Israel. Um, but God chose to place his presence there in the Holy of Holies. As a matter of fact, uh, we can read um, in, in the book of Kings, you know, where King Solomon, um, he was the one that, that David uh, instructed that he uh, would build that uh, temple. And uh, when we read on the dedication day of that temple, that fire came down from heaven uh, which was a picture, if you will, of the presence of God that took his place in that tabernacle. So this is why whenever you read the Psalms and you read about Mount Zion, you read about the city of David, um, you read about the fact that God's presence is there. So in Psalm 48, um, I, I want us to look at what at least three, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four things uh, I, I want us to look at with regard to God's presence. Um, in verses 1 through 3, we see the beauty of God's presence. Look at what it says. Verse 1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. So notice what it says. So in these first three verses, it's talking uh, about the beauty of Mount Zion. And it's beautiful because of God's presence. Notice what it says. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Of course, to them, the city of God was absolutely the city of Jerusalem. Beautiful in elevation, it is the joy of all the earth. And beautiful in elevation because people had to move up toward the temple. It was raised, it was uh, 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 a position that was much higher than the rest of the city. Beautiful in elevation, it is the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion in the far north, in the city of the great king, with her citadels. And God has made himself known as a fortress. So not only 
was the presence of God a thing of beautiful, a thing of beauty? But we read in the next section, in verses four through eight, it is also a place of safety, a place of safety, uh, because even at the end of verse three, it talks about citadels. God has made Himself known as a fortress. But it's a place of safety because it says, look at verse 4, it says, For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic, and they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them their anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen, in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. Now, what was this all about? What, what was the psalmist referring to here? Um, he, t he tells us that it is a place of beauty in verses 1 through 3, but then he begins to tell us that it is also a place of safety because of what he says, look, the kings assembled and they came on together and as soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic and they took to flight. What's he referring to here? He's referring to the fact that people recognized and realized that this was the city of the God of Israel. This was the place where God had his presence known and it was a place that the Jews could be safe at least up to this point, that was exactly the case. Because keep in mind, all during biblical days, there were wars going on all the time. Um, I don't know if you remember in history class, talking about city-states, um, but uh, I would say back in biblical times, uh, they were city uh, they were city villages and uh, often villages would go at war one with another. And so here he's talking about these, these kings, which would be um, a term that was used for um, these village leaders. Often they would come together and they would, maybe we ought to uh, attack uh, Jerusalem, but they came and they realized, uh-uh, um, we, we can't win here, and they took flight. And, and so the, the people trembled. Um, in um, Second Chronicles um, chapter five, it, it, it talks um, uh, a little bit about what, what happens here um, in, in this particular city. Um, it, it's, it, it talks about the fact that Solomon, once the temple was built, he gathered all the elders and they wanted to bring uh, the Ark of the Covenant into the city, it says, in verse 2 of 2 Chronicles 5, it says, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. And it talks about um, the, the wonderful um, time of worship that they all had because of the presence um, of the Lord. And so we see um, that it was a place of safety. Um, it says in verse seven, by the east wind you shatter the sh ships of Tarshish. These were the, the ships that often would try to come um, uh, uh, off the Mediterranean and come and attack and God protected them. It says, we have heard, so we have, as we have heard, so have we seen the city of the Lord of hosts in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. So we know from verses one through three, the presence of the Lord, the city of David, Jerusalem, Mount Zion is another term used for the same place. It was not only a place of beauty, it was also a place of safety. But then it was also a city or a place of love and praise. It was a city of love and praise. Um, look at what it says in verses 9, 10, and 11. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, 
in the midst of your temple. Notice that the presence of God urged them to be thinking about God. Notice that it says, we have thought on your steadfast love. You know, we call that meditation. What, what is meditation? Meditation is thinking through, it's pondering, it, it's trying to understand, it's comprehending. And so he says, we have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Uh, have you ever wondered why? Why did God love us so? You know, one of, one of the, the most quoted and most known verse of scripture is John 3 16 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have life eternal and so eternal life is not based upon how many good deeds we've done our eternal life is based upon what Jesus did for us in our place and that's why we are called upon, yet even commanded, to trust Him and Him alone as our only hope for salvation. You see, salvation is not found in the church. Salvation is not found in a denomination. Salvation is not found in religion. Salvation is in the person and work of Jesus Christ and what He did for you and me. And so, you know, the day that we leave this earth and, and we come to the door of heaven, and, you know, people think because Peter has the keys to the kingdom that he's going to be at the door. Uh, and, and the average person says, you know, what are you going to say to St. Peter when you get to heaven? What are you going to say to him when he says, why should I let you in here? And if you start saying, well, you know, I went to church so many times, I gave so much money here, I tried to be a good person, I paid my taxes, he's going to say, hey, wait a second, that's not how you get here. Uh, what I wanted to hear from you is, what did you do with Jesus? How did you respond to his offer of salvation? You see, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is why the Apostle Paul said, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the truth of the matter is, a gift does you no good unless you receive it. I mean, an unreceived gift does absolutely nothing for you. So how do you receive God's gift? You receive it by faith. When you come to him and say, Lord, I know I'm lost. I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve heaven. But I thank you so much for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on a cross and shed his blood to pay the penalty of my sin. And, and God, I thank you so much that you accepted his sacrifice on my behalf so that I could be your child. You see, this is why in Psalm 48 they are talking about Mount Zion because it is a picture, if you will, of God's presence. God's presence, it's a thing of beauty. It's a thing of safety. It's also a thing of love and praise. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple, verse 10, as your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgment. You see, it, it is a city, it is a place of joy. It's a place of happiness. Uh, we've thought on your steadfast love, and as your name, O oh God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion 
be glad. You see, the presence of the Lord is a place of love. It's a place of praise. Um, verses 12 through 14. It is also a place of security and guidance. Security and guidance. The presence of the Lord gives us security. You know, if the question is asked, um, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Do you know that the Bible tells us that you can say, yes, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die today, I, I would be in God's presence in heaven. And you say, well, isn't that kind of presumptuous? Um, no, it's not presumptuous. It's believing what God says in his word. As a matter of fact, in, in the first epistle of John, you know, the Apostle John, he wrote five books of the New Testament. The Gospel of John, the Book of Revelation, and also 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. These three letters. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says this. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, do you believe that or not? I mean, that's, that's the truth. The, he says, I've written these things so that you can K-N-O-W, that you may know that you have eternal life. And so when you think of Mount Zion here in Psalm 48, it, it, it is, it is a, a city, a mountain, that also provides, if you will, security and guidance. Look at what it says in verse 12. It says, walk about Zion, go around her and number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels. Now, that interesting that uh, one of the things that the psalmist says that we ought to see in the city of God, one of the things we ought to see in Jerusalem, one of the things we ought to see on Mount Zion is how secure it is how secure it is you know very often today people are so insecure they they don't really know where their safety lies i mean when, when you think of what's happening in our world today when you think of what is happening in our country that 50 years ago we never would have believed that we were would be at the place that we are today. Um, how the things of God have actually been kind of put aside. You know, it all started back in the 60s. You know, when we couldn't pray in school anymore. We couldn't have the Bible read to us in school anymore. And, and we're seeing more and more and more as time goes on. You know, how the things of God are really put in the background uh, and not only put in the background some have just refused to believe them altogether but here he says look walk around Zion and what do you see you see these ramparts you see these citadels you see these towers in God's presence it is a place of safety it is a place of security it's a place of beauty. It's a place of love. It's a place of praise. It's a place of guidance. He says, go through uh, the towers, the ramparts, and the citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God. You see, why is it that God wants us to enjoy his presence? Why does he want us to learn his word, to become familiar with his word, the Bible, so that we can not only experience it ourselves, but that we may share it with other people. This is why he says that you may go and tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever, he will what? Guide us forever. So the presence of God, Mount Zion, is a symbol, if you will, of God's presence. How can you and I have God's presence in our lives? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge who
who he is. Uh, I've said this before, and I'll probably say it a million times again. It is more than believing in God. You know, uh, when a person is introduced to the gospel, and they're introduced to the fact that they need salvation, what are they going to say? Most often they will say, well, I believe in God. And without being too flippant, I would say to them, well, congratulations, because even the devil believes in God. It's believing God, not just believing in God, but believing God. When God says something to you, how does he do it? Through here through the word of God, through the scriptures. And what does he say? He says, God will guide us forever. He will lead us in our lives. So having Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord, not only introduces you to the beauty of his holiness, not only does it introduce you to the safety of belonging to him, it introduces us to love and praise. It introduces us to security and guidance. So this is what the sons of Korah wanted us to learn about Almighty God. And we see it in Psalm 48. But then we come to the last psalm that the sons of Korah were involved in. And it's Psalm 49. And you say, well, what did you title Psalm 49? Uh, it, it's, it's a phrase that I'm sure you have heard before. I had entitled Psalm 49, The Great Equalizer. The Great Equalizer. And what is Psalm 49 talking about? Well, in, in Psalm 49, you know, we have 20 <coughs> verses. And uh, I've con kind of divided it into, into four areas. In, in verses one through four, I've, call, I've said about these first four verses, listen intently, listen intently. Um, that because verses one through four have a very serious message for us. So, um, all throughout scripture, by the way, you, you will hear this phrase, hear the word of the Lord, hear the word of the Lord. And it doesn't just mean, you know, let the words uh, make contact with your ears. It, it's actually saying, listen intently, listen to what is being said because it is being said for a reason. And, and so in verses one through four, um, it says this, hear this, all peoples, give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. You say, no, I, I understood it all the way up until verse four. Um, what does it mean, I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre? Keep in mind that the Psalms, all 150 of the Psalms in the Old Testament is what is referred to as the Psalter or the hymn book of Israel. Um, these psalms were not just read, these psalms were sung, and, and it was part of their worship when they would gather um, at the temple, and later, after the temple was destroyed, they then began the synagogue movement, and they would gather together in synagogues, and part of their worship was singing these, these various psalms, and, and so, Notice in these first four verses, it says, listen intently. Um, he says, and it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. This is why beginning, I talked about this being the great equalizer. 
because this is everybody needs to listen to this. Whether you're religious or irreligious, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're in high class society or low class society, everybody needs to listen. It says, give ear all the inhabitants of the earth. My mouth shall speak wisdom. These are wise words. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle. In other words, I will solve the problems that I have in life, the questions that I have in life. Uh, they refer to it as, as a riddle because many people will say, man, I, I just don't understand why things are happening the way they are. I, I don't understand this, I don't understand this. He says, I will solve my riddle by paying attention to what's written here but I can do it with music. You know, uh, music helps us to remember things. You know, I, I hate to admit this, but I could probably sing um, a cigarette commercial. <laughs> because when I was growing up as a kid, I would hear it on the radio all the time. You know? You could take Salem out of the country, but, remember that one? Yeah, but you can't take the country, well, anyway. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is, music sometimes helps us to understand truth. This is why we, we sing hymns and we sing choruses. Um, I, I, I love Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Think about that all along. All right, listen intently. It says, now, verses 5 through 9, uh, I've called this realize seriously. Not only listen intently, but now realize what he's saying very seriously. He says in verse 5, he says, why should I fear in times of trouble? when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. What was this section all about? This is why I've entitled this, Realize Seriously What He's Saying. You know, there are a lot of people today who believe that they could buy their way into heaven. There are a lot of people who think that, man, if I'm generous enough, that means God's going to look down on me and he's going to accept me into heaven because I've been a generous person. Many people think that money will buy them happiness. That if they are sound financially, then life is going to be good for them. You know, the, uh, I don't know if you've ever read any biographies of some of the richest people in the world, but one of the things that is often true of very, very wealthy people is that they always want more. How much more do you need? Well, just a little bit more. And the word more is very common. Um, but you know, yet our, our safety, our security is not in how much money we have or how much status we have. Th this is why the psalmist says, now why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? He said, why should I fear in times of trouble when, when the, the rich who are surround me are just trusting in their wealth. I don't fear because not only he says, I don't fear not only because I don't have wealth, but he says in verse seven, no man can ransom another. No individual can pay for another or give to God the price of his life. This is why we need to trust 
in Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. And you see, he offered himself as a sacrifice to God. Why? Because he was the only perfect sacrifice. Remember what happened in the Old Testament that God gave the nation of Israel a means of coming to him. And one of the means of coming to him was this. They would take a lamb, but it had to be a certain kind of lamb. It had to be a year old. There could not be any blemish or spot on that lamb. In other words, you couldn't go through your flock of sheep and say, ah, oh, this one has a broken leg. I think I'll offer that one. You couldn't offer it. It had to be a perfect lamb without spot and without blemish. Why was that? It was all in preparation for the fact that one day the Lamb of God would come to earth, Jesus Christ himself. And why was his offering on the cross accepted? Because he was a lamb without blemish and without spot. He did no sin, the Bible tells us, neither was any guile or deceit found in his mouth. And he offered the only kind of sacrifice that was acceptable to God, a perfect sacrifice. You see, if you and I said, well, okay, I'll give my life. Yeah, but your life and my life is not perfect. It's not without blemish. It's not without spot. This is why we need the Lord Jesus. So he says, no man can ransom another for the ransom of their life is costly and it can never suffice. You see, there, there isn't any way that we could offer ourselves that, that we should live on forever and never see the pit. The pit, that of course is what is referred to as the place of the departed dead. So he says, listen intently in verses one through four. He says, realize seriously what this is all about in verses five through nine. And then he says in verses 10 through 15, consider wisely. Consider wisely. He, he says, look at verse 10. For he sees that even the wise die. The fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they call lands by their own names. You know, what, what's he making reference to? He's making reference to the fact that often people, will, they want their name to live on forever. They, they want their name uh, to be remembered by others. And so very often what happens is, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you this piece of land if, if you name it after me. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll provide money for this building if, if you name it after me. You see, this is kind of um, the, the way people want their, their, their fame, their name to, to live on forever. But what is he saying? He's saying, look, even wise people as well as foolish people they have the great equalizer. And what is the great equalizer? The great equalizer is death. Every one of us is going to face death. So the question is, how do we prepare for that day? How do we prepare for the day that God calls us to himself? Or, if you and I die without Christ, we have a hopeless and Christless eternity without him. So he, he says, their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, even if they call lands by their own names. This is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupts and thieves break through 
and steal, but lay up for yourselves what treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts nor thieves break through and steal. And how do you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven? It's by, first of all, admitting your need for a Savior and putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you and I when he died and rose again. And we live for him. And when we live for Christ, what does it mean? It means that, that we live lives that are pleasing in his sight. And remember, when you become a Christian, by the way, no one is born a Christian. If you say, well, I've been a Christian all my life, well, you've just violated one of the commandments by bearing false witness because you have never been a Christian all your life. A person has to become a Christian by faith. And that faith is not in a church. It's not in a clergyman. It's not in your behavior. Your faith is in what Jesus Christ did for you when he died and rose again. And in response to realizing what he did for us, we say, Lord, take my life and let it be. Use me for your glory. And it doesn't mean that that you become a missionary or you become a, a preacher. It's, Lord, I want you to use my life in whatever way you can, that I may be uh, a help to others, that I might be able to share the words of the gospel with those that don't know you. Uh, it, it says in verse 12, man in his pomp will not remain. That's an interesting word. It actually means assets. Man and his assets will not remain. He's like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. You know, isn't that interesting? That's an interesting term. People who have foolish confidence. In other words, these are people who think, yeah, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to go to heaven when I die because I've been a good person. That's foolish confidence. That's what it says here, because it is, you, you and I don't go to heaven based on whether we're a good person or not. We go to heaven based upon what we have done with Jesus Christ. Do we believe in him and believe what he says? And do we accept his offer of salvation? It says, you notice the word sila or silah. On, uh, you'll see it often on a number of songs. It literally means pause and think of that. Pause and think of that. Um, he says, verse 14, like sheep they are appointed for Sheol, that is the place of the departed dead. Death shall be their shepherd. These are people who have confidence in themselves as opposed to confidence in God. Notice the contrast between this verse where it says, death shall be their shepherd. Think of the contrast between Psalm 23, when the Lord is my shepherd. But here he says, death is their shepherd and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in shield with no place to dwell. Um, you know, the scripture has a, um, has a parable in the 16th chapter of Luke. It was the rich man and Lazarus. And, and the rich man thought that he was going to be going to heaven, but he certainly wasn't. But Lazarus, who was very poor, you know, he trusted in Christ. And he was in glory. There was a big difference. Uh, we don't have time. We're almost out of time. Um, but uh, I want us to look at uh, verses 16. Uh, well, let's look at 15 first because it's, it's part of that um, section where we called it consider wisely. Look at what he says. God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. 
Isn't that interesting? He will receive me. Uh, I think of two people in the Old Testament that God received. One of them was the name of Enoch. And we read about Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 and the 24th verse. Enoch, it says, he walked with God and then he was not for God took him. He didn't see death. Uh, there was a, another man in the Old Testament. Uh, his name was Elijah. And, and we read about him in, in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 2, when he went to glory in a chariot of fire. In other words, here the psalmist in verse 15 says that God will ransom my soul from the power of the pit, which is Sheol. And he says, for he will receive me. And why will he receive me? Not on the basis of my goodness, but on the basis of his grace and his kindness toward me by placing me in his family. And then verses 16 through 20, I have uh, three minutes and uh, 51 seconds uh, to finish, but look what it says. Um, verses 16 through 20, I've titled that, Tread Carefully. Tread carefully. It says, be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, that is man in his assets, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. And interesting that the term understanding was found in verse 1, uh, verse 3 actually, verse 3, the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. But then notice in verse 20, he talks about the man um, in his assets without understanding is like the beast that perish. Um, you know, there's, there's three terms I think we could use in this section, verses 16 through 20. One is fear not. It says don't be afraid when a man becomes worth of rich. Then it says in verse 18, envy not. <laughs> don't envy him. He says, for though while he lives he counts himself blessed because of his finances and though you get praise when you do well for yourself his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never see light. And, and then I think we can close this by saying, follow not, don't follow that man, don't follow that person who's depending upon his wealth, he's depending upon his wisdom, he's depending upon his good deeds. No, he says that man has, doesn't have understanding. Because the man who has understanding is the man who trusts Jesus Christ. That's the person that has understanding. This is why Solomon said in Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Isn't that what we just read this morning? Trust in him with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways, all your ways, every part of your life, every concept of your life, every morning when you get up, Lord, thank you for a night's rest. Lord, help me to live for you today. Lord, I want to please you this morning. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And how does he direct your path? He gives you a lot of information and instruction right here in this book. Don't let the dust collect on your Bible. Read it every day. Loving Father, we are so grateful for your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness. 
Thank you, Father, for helping us to know your truth. We realize, Father, that it is only by your spirit that we can really begin to comprehend what you would have us to know and learn. Thank you for the truth that we find in your word. I pray, Lord, that as we embark upon another week, may we look to you for wisdom, look to you for instruction. In all our ways, we want to acknowledge you, our Father. So dismiss us, we pray, from this time together with your blessing, and we'll give you the thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.